uh, Parliament wrestled with that question for 16 months. It went through two houses of Parliament, the House of Commons and the Senate. They brought in experts from all over the country. Canada engaged in a debate over that issue for 16 months. And one judge, one judge strikes it down. That's ridiculous. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Return to Reason. My name is David Craig, and I'm honored to be hosting my guest today. What is our responsibility and duty as Canadian citizens? Are those duties impacted if we claim to be Christians? Andre Schutten is a Director of Law and Public Policy and General Legal Counsel for ARPA Canada, an organization passionate to empower and educate Canadians to influence the nation, its values and subsequent laws. Joining us from Ottawa, you'll love this conversation. Stay tuned. Today, a special episode of Return to Reason, where knowledge and wisdom intersect. Hey Andre, well, welcome to Return to Reason. So glad to have you today. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to jump into uh, the conversation with you today. I know there's a lot of areas that you and ARPA have been continually uh, building towards uh, to create not just education for Canadians, but also to create action amongst. Mm -hmm. Do you mind just maybe quickly talking uh, a little bit about your role with ARPA and how you fell into that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm trained as a lawyer. I, I did my law degree at the University of Ottawa. Yep. Um, and But I'm not a traditional lawyer. Uh, I, I do some court appearances for, for ARPA Canada. We, uh, we engage in the courts on important constitutional cases that relate to our fundamental freedoms, that relate to the questions of the sanctity of human life, yep. uh, equality and human rights, uh, those kinds of issues. So I've, I've had the pleasure and the privilege of being in uh, many different courts across the country, courts of appeal, the Supreme Court of Canada, on those kinds of questions. Um, and then, but we also want to make sure that we equip uh, grassroots Canadians, particularly our constituency being uh, Christians, as citizens in this country, to be engaged in the political process, to be engaged in the political issues that, that matter to them. They're citizens of this country. That means they have a voice too. This is yeah. a, a democratic country. So they should exercise that. And, and we want to be there to help them do that winsomely, uh, effectively uh, in a way that blesses Canada. You mentioned um, taking action. I think a lot of times Canadians, and even generally depending on, on the times that we live in, is that citizens can look at the government from time to time as if the government is a boss or lording over its people or telling you what to do, whereas it's the other way around. The government is actually there on behalf of the people because the people put the government in place. Maybe talk about that relationship and why it's important for citizens of a country to be active in, uh, in government and in the role of government. Yeah, I think, I think that it's important because it, it helps keep uh, the civil government accountable. Um, the civil government, I'd say from a from a Christian perspective, we'd say that the, the civil government is actually instituted uh, by God. It's actually a gift to humankind to have civil government um, in order to preserve justice in a nation, to, to protect the human rights of, of individual citizens, um, to to be a force against the force of anarchy. But but with civil government, because of the power that it has, it has a tendency towards uh, tyranny. So it, if on one side you have no government, you have anarchy, then on the other side of the spectrum you have tyranny. Mm -hmm. And I think that that in a democratic society that has a, a, a solid value system, uh, good ethics, um, that, that what we try to get is a balance between the two where, where civil government plays an important role, a very important role, one that we should be thankful for, uh, as long as it stays within its lane. And that, that way we balance out and, and contain anarchy on the one side without devolving into tyranny on the other side. Um, and so it's the role of citizens in particular to, to make sure that that happens by being engaged in the political process, not just voting on election day. That's very important. Every citizen should do that. Uh, but but also following the issues, um, you know, week to week, making sure they understand what's happening in Parliament, what's happening in uh, in the higher courts anyway, and, and what's happening in their provincial legislatures. Yeah, that's well said and very well said. Now, you yourself, uh, in conjunction with ARPA, you guys released a book, and that was called A Christian's Citizenship Guide. Uh, first of all, what motivated you guys regarding this, and what did you see as a result of it? Yeah, so the, the I've got a, a copy right here, A Christian <laughs> Citizenship Guide, the second yeah. edition. Uh, so a first edition was written, it was quite a bit smaller. It was written about uh, 11 or 12 years ago. Uh, it was just meant to be a, a resource for Christians in this nation 
to, to think about a, a few different uh, political issues, particularly human rights, um, the Constitution, how government works, a really basic guide to how the civil government works, yeah. and then, uh, you know, how to be active and engaged. Um, we've now expanded that quite significantly um, and, and added more, more legal nuance, more political nuance to it. So uh, we, th we just saw a need in Canada to have a guide that specifically speaks to, to Christians to say, hey, you've got a You've got an important role to play, uh, and you can make a difference. You can make a positive difference. You can bless this nation by being uh, better informed and and more involved. And and that's what the the, the purpose of this guide is. Now, yeah. I would say like that uh, there's some some people that have you know we posted about this on Twitter and and Facebook, and we've heard some feedback from from non Christians, fellow fellow citizens, who who feel uneasy about that idea. Oh, Christian citizenship, like doesn't that sound like uh, you know, theocracy where, where, you know, the, the church starts ruling Canada or something like that. Sure. And, it, and it's not that at all. Uh, if we actually, and, and this is explained in the book, that if we understand the proper role of, of the state, of the civil government, and the proper role of other important institutions in society, uh, then I think uh, that's going to be a good thing for a free and democratic society like Canada. That starts with us understanding how the constitution works, how human rights work and where they come from, how we should be involved um, at, as citizens in this country. And, and of course, every citizen has that right. So, so whether you're Buddhist or, or Sikh or you're a secular humanist, uh, an atheist or a Christian, if you're a citizen in this country, you have a right, and I would say even a responsibility, uh, to be involved. And, and so we want to speak specifically to that Christian constituency in this book yeah. to say, hey, this is how you can get involved. I, and I would encourage any non-Christian to pick up the book and, and read it as well. I, I, yeah. I think it provides a nuanced uh, approach to citizenship that a non-Christian might appreciate as well. I think that right now we live in a generation where we're almost learning to become afraid of expressing different opinions. And mm -hmm. if you look at what the foundation of democracy is, it's bringing different ideas to the table, not mm -hmm. being offended by someone's disagreement, but being able to work out these ideas and, and in our instant letting iron sharpen iron, and we move to the way that, that we have in, in this great country. Mm -hmm. Question for you regarding our democracy, and, and, and also I want to move a little bit into the role of media, because media is obviously a very important part of democracy in terms of educating people on what's going on. Do you view that our current democracy, maybe generally in North America and specifically Canada, has been eroding? There's a, there's a wide opinion, a wide range opinion regarding our media and how media might not necessarily represent what's actually going on. So do you notice an erosion of democracy? Yeah, I think, I think what, what we're seeing is um, we're, we're seeing a, a pretty major worldview shift. Uh, worldview being the, the, the general, generally accepted view of how the world works, which has uh, underlying it religious or philosophical assumptions or presumptions. And the dominant worldview shift has occurred, I think, particularly in the last 70 or 80 years. If you go back to before Second World War, the dominant worldview within North America was a Christian one. And, and in the last 70, 80 years, it, it's shifted much more towards a secular humanist one. So secular humanism as, a, as an outlook on life, uh, as a worldview, a, 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 uh, sorry, a way to view the world, yeah. um, is, I, I argue, would be the dominant worldview, the dominant religious philosophical uh, view of, of how life is lived, how, why we're here, what our purpose on, on earth is and so on that that worldview is entrenched it's the dominant view in in the civil government it's the dominant view in the academy and it's the dominant view in the mainstream media um and that's just a reality I, I, i'm not saying that's necessarily a, a bad thing or necessarily a good thing it's it's just that is the reality and so what that means is is that particularly on your question on the mainstream media what that means is that it it's going to report on the news from that perspective, it's it's the it's the water that they're swimming in. It's the air that they breathe. Secular humanism is informing the way they see the news. Uh, it's informing them the the way those journalists are uh, interpreting events around them, uh, bills that are introduced in parliament, how they report on them, uh, how citizens react to them. All of that's coming through the filter of uh, secular humanism, which is which is a religion. It's a religious, um, absolutely philosophical position. Yeah. Um, so I think once our viewers understand that, that might help, that can help 
us then just evaluate and an analyze how the, the news is put to us. Is it is it truly purely objective or is there actually unconscious or conscious? Is there actually a, a bit of a spin or a, a coloring of, of the news coming out of that religious presupposition, that, that philosophical uh, outlook? Absolutely. There, you know, there's... Um... The reason why we started this program and, and, and Leon Fontaine started this program a number of years ago called Return to Reason, because it seems to be a, this departation from reason or common sense, um, mm -hmm. which I, I also believe is largely driven by, by a worldview that has an agenda. Um, and and I, that's why I think it's also very important that no matter what people's beliefs are, it's important for you to speak your mind, to understand that what you believe and what you think regarding this country is important. Um, I also do like to point out that our, our, our country of Canada, and you look at the United States and, and a lot of the Western world, is founded upon Judeo-Christian principles. That does not mean people need to be a Christian at all. It just means that these are principles that are founded on that basis, which has really created the, these free and, and democratic societies that people love to move to. But I want to mm -hmm. ask you a question. Why is it important specifically for Christians to, to understand our rights and our rights within Canada? Yeah. So um, there's, there's a wrong way and a right way to understand our, our rights. So if a Christian wants to know about their rights primarily or only because they're looking out for themselves, they want to do what they want, when they want, how they yeah. want, uh, and they don't want anybody else to ever tell them what to do. That's the wrong way from a Christian perspective. That's the wrong way and the wrong reason to be concerned about rights. Mm -hmm. That said, and, and, and so, yeah, so I, that said, I've heard people say, fellow Christians say, I've heard pastors say this, that, that people, Christians who are concerned about freedom or concerned about rights, that they're being selfish. Yeah. And if, in fact, an individual is, you know, is motivated for the reason I just listed, right, I get to do what I want, when I want, how I want, nobody else can tell me otherwise, then, yeah, there, there's a selfish motivation there. But there's actually a very unselfish public good uh, that happens when citizens, Christian or not, advocate for human rights, advocate for human liberty or freedom. Uh, and that is because a free and democratic society, which Canada is or is supposed to be, yeah. uh, that, that's what our, our Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, describes us as, a free and democratic society. Um, such a society allows every human being, every citizen to flourish. Totally. Um, and so when it comes to the question of freedom, wh what is it for? Um, we understand and we should understand that it's first for the ability for humans to be fully human. Um, so, so consider, for example, the Charter, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The, the, the first section that lays out our freedoms is Section 2. We can talk about Section 1 later if you want. Sure. But yeah, yeah. Section 2 lists the first set of freedoms that every Canadian should have. The fundamental freedoms are called freedom of religion and conscience. That's Section 2A. Freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including the press. Freedom of the press. That's Section 2B. Freedom of peaceful assembly, 2C. And freedom of... Um, association, which is section 2D. Those are fundamental freedoms. Now, yes. now, if we're advocating for them, some people would say, oh, that's selfish. You just want to do what you want. It's like, no, 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 no. What we're doing when we advocate for those freedoms, we advocate for them for everybody in the country, for all Canadians. And, and it's because they, they help us to flourish as human beings. They allow us to be fully human. Like, what does it mean to be human? We have to have our anthropology straight, right? In order to understand law and, and whether it's good or not, we have to understand who the law is for. It's for human beings. And, and then we have to understand, well, what is a human being in order for us to, to, to create the best human rights legislation uh, possible? So, so what does it mean to be human? Well, to be human is to be a, a moral agent. That's what distinguishes us from the animals. So if we're, we're a moral agency, we have moral agency, and we want to respect that amongst each other, when we need freedom of conscience, which protects that moral agency, it's going to show that you know what, I might totally disagree with you, but I'm going to bend towards accommodating your uh, religious or conscientious mm. objections because I'm going to respect you as a human being. It goes to the core of who you are. Yeah. Likewise, to be human is to wrestle with the big religious questions. Again, whether you're religious or not, you have, um, you have come to conclusions or you live as if you've come to conclusions on the big religious questions. Why am I here? Uh, why is there suffering in the world? What is my purpose in life? Where are we going? Uh, those are big religious questions that science can't answer for us, yeah. uh, that philosophy struggles to answer. Uh, but 
the major religious traditions of the world do uh, answer. And freedom of religion says, I'm going to respect your humanity by respecting your religious practices as you try to find the answers or live out your life according to the answers of those questions. Same thing with freedom of expression. To be human is to be expressive, to be uh, able to conduct a rational argument. Um, you know, to, to protect freedom of expression means we're protecting that human aspect between us that we can rationally argue, come to opinions, shape our opinions and our beliefs and express them to other people. Freedom of peaceful assembly recognizes yeah. that as human beings, we are embodied. We're not just spirits floating in the ether. Our bodies matter and we live in relationship to each other. That's what it means to be human. Freedom of peaceful assembly protects that. And finally, um, to be human is to be collaborative and industrious. We don't just live in isolation. We, we work together. When we work together with other human beings, we produce wonderful things, great things, technological sure. advancements, architecture, etc. That happens when we associate together. Um, and, and that's what that protects. So when we're advocating for those fundamental freedoms, it's not selfish. It's, it's to allow our fellow Canadians and ourselves in community with other people to flourish, to be the best it's we can really be. It's really progress, 100%. You've seen the results of that over the years of when you look at countries and how much it's lifted people out of poverty. You've right. seen how many, like, you can, we can go on for list several things of what's happened when you've dis described the community that you just described. And, but mm -hmm. you mentioned at the beginning about, we, we you skipped over number one in the charter. And obviously mm -hmm. I think in the last couple of years, starting from COVID in 2020 and on, it's become a, a hot topic, and, and I've had several conversations with, with people who are, are involved directly in politics and, and former politicians, and, and, and a former leader of the opposition described Section 1, um, and this was also on, on a, a public thing, as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Well, essentially where it talks about how that our charter of rights and freedoms are guaranteed our rights and freedoms are guaranteed set out subject only to what is reasonable limits prescribed i'm forgetting the exact by law and demonstrably justified i think i got it that's yep. called david's paraphrase version <laughs> might be a couple <laughs> missing words but that seems to be and that that's very different than how the u.s constitution is mm -hmm. laid out Mm -hmm. Being a lot yeah. of people, because our, our society and our culture overlaps a lot, Canada and the United States, people, I've, and I've probably been guilty of that in the past, just assume there's a lot of similarities. And maybe just talk about, number one, mm -hmm. I got a, couple, a lot of questions on that, but number one, a little bit in terms of your opinion, in terms of how that gives active governments freedom to mm -hmm. maybe push and pull on people's rights that are set out in number two and, and, and throughout our charter. And then, if you don't mind, I can remind you at the end too. Maybe talk about the differences between Canada and the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so I do get a, a little bit into that in the book as well, right. uh, Christian Citizenship Guide. I, I, I do I analyze that section one of our our charter. And you're right. It what it what it does is it it lays out. So it's actually titled. If you look at the original draft of the of the charter, yeah. the one that was passed into into our constitution, added to our constitution. Section one is titled the guarantee clause, right? So yeah. it's supposed to be the clause that says all of your rights that are laid out in here are guaranteed. But what's happened over the last three decades is that it it's almost always referred to by judges, by lawyers and by uh, political scientists and so on. It's almost always referred to as the limitation clause or the reasonable okay. limits clause, which yeah. is not what it's called. But the reason the reason is because a lot of the case law that's developed since the charter was brought into Canada in 1982, a lot of the court judgments don't focus on the guarantee and the high standard that we need to hold the government to before we allow them to limit charter rights. Yeah. Uh, but instead, it's now shifted more to the reasonableness of the limits and, and giving more and more, in my opinion, giving more and more deference to the government as they do limit our fundamental freedoms and limit our rights in various ways. So, um, so I think that, and that's a big difference between the Canadian system, the Canadian constitution and the American constitution. The American constitution doesn't have a reasonable limits clause. Uh, it doesn't have a, a clause that's right at the beginning of their uh, bill of rights that says, well, all of these rights that are laid out to it are, are subject to reasonable limits that a government can impose for good reason. Yeah. Now, now, I'm not opposed to the Canadian limit on uh, fundamental freedoms um, and, and other charter rights. I'll give you an extreme example, right? Should should there be a law? Should we tolerate a law in a free and democratic society that makes it a criminal offense to um, advocate for, um, uh, like, to advocate hate speech to the level of like calling for violence against um, other other people, other citizens, or particular per people group? 
and and we gut reaction everyone would agree in canada yeah i mean almost everyone you know 99 percent of canadians would agree like such a law would be reasonable so what one could argue is like well that law does it infringe on does it infringe on freedom of expression the uh, the ability for somebody to advocate for an idea that certain people are not worth protection in law you know uh, perhaps it's it's a it's a a bit of a limit on the free yeah. expression of that idea but that idea sure. is odious in a free and democratic society and that's why when we go to section one we would say yeah that limit on full absolute freedom of expression that limit is justified in a free and democratic society we can't flourish as a free and democratic society if we tolerate you sure. know uh, calls to violence against some of our citizens it won't be a yeah. free and democratic society anymore right so so reasonable limits at the periphery i think is probably a good thing. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, the limits have become more and more um, limiting, such that you know limits on freedom of uh, peaceful assembly or limits on on freedom of religion, in particular, um, are now allowed where the deference to the government is not the high, demonstrably justified that you need to have these limits to have a free and democratic society, which would be a really high high bar for the government to meet. Now it's like, well. Oh, this is my paraphrase. The courts yeah. haven't written it quite yeah. this way, but it's almost as if the courts are saying, the Supreme Court is saying, you know what? Did the government have a, a, a decent reason to pass the law? Uh, did they, you know, do a half half decent job of just, you know, trying to minimally impair your your rights? Uh, if so, we'll we'll just defer to them. We'll we'll allow the government yeah. to pass this restriction. And um, I think that that's a problematic development, and I talk about that in in uh, in this yeah. book as well. Because there seems to be a growing movement, and I'm not saying it's a large movement yet, that that our charter sh should be due for an update or potentially a, a revised number one and a couple other revisions. Where do you stand on that line? Do you, do you think mm -hmm. it's still um, acceptable for where we're at now in 2023? Um, mm -hmm. Is it due for an update or do you think we can still continue to function? Because COVID obviously exposed maybe some weaknesses, not necessarily in the charter, but in, in how our whole system functions, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, and you know, we could probably do a, a three hour special yeah, on, uh, on the Let's answer to it. that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'd say two two institutions that I think um, need to to make adjustments uh, primarily. So citizens have a responsibility to, to, to have these conversations still with their elected uh, representatives. Yeah. But the two institutions I think that are primarily responsible uh, for where charter interpretation has gone over the last three years is, or last three decades, sorry, is the Supreme Court of Canada and Parliament itself. Parliament in its silence and the Supreme Court of Canada in its activism. And so I think you know, moving forward, I don't so much think that the, the charter needs a rewrite. I think the language of the charter, what's there, is is generally pretty good. Um, you know, I definitely, I definitely know of um, other Christian legal scholars who who don't see the charter as being a good thing. But I think yeah. that it's a workable document. It is part sure. of our constitution. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. Yes. Uh, to rewrite any part of it would be very, very difficult. Very difficult. But what could be done uh, to just rein in some of the excessive um, uh, decisions from the Supreme Court is that I think the Supreme Court itself needs to uh, to not see itself as a policy maker and, and a driver of cultural change, hmm. which I think too many of the judges on that court see themselves as. Uh, in point. fact, some of them have even admitted as such in, in press conferences and in op-eds published in Globe and Mail and elsewhere. Well, some um, judges have even jumped into activism at some point. Uh, yeah, sorry I, to interrupt, but it, that that you've seen that growing, especially when it comes to social justice in a sense. But sorry, keep going. Yeah, no, no, and you're absolutely right. And I think I think that's an issue. I think that judges need to have uh, a, a pretty high level of humility. They have an incredible amount of power in this yeah. country, uh, and so so we need judges to be self restrained. Uh, and that and it's tough to do. You need men and women of character who sit on that bench that are willing to be self uh, restrained. And, and rule on the law as the law is written, not as they want it to be written. So, so that, that's the first part. I think the Supreme Court Canada itself ought to do a bit, bit of a correction over what it's been doing over the last three decades. Um, and then the second part is that then Parliament itself needs to start exercising its authority more. Um, there's, there, there are options available to Parliament to push back on the more excessive rulings of the Supreme Court. And that has happened from time to time. For example, a pretty famous case last year, uh, some of our viewers might have might have heard about it last year. The Supreme Court of Canada struck down a criminal prohibition around 
it was a sexual crime um, uh, related to minors, and they struck down a, a provision of it, and it was on a more technical criminal yeah. law uh, reasoning behind it. Uh, it was a charter charter argument, and Parliament responded almost immediately. They passed very very quickly. It was within a matter of a month or two months. They they passed an amendment to get that law right back in in with with a slight amendment, a slight tweak. They so they, yeah. you know. It looked like Supreme Court had struck down an important uh, provision in the criminal code. Parliament reacted and reintroduced basically the same thing. They just tweaked a little little bit, but the protection went right back in to the criminal code. We need to see that kind of thing happen. Uh, instead, what we're seeing is, you know, take an issue like like uh, euthanasia or assisted suicide. You know, the Supreme Court of Canada struck down our total prohibition on assisted suicide back in 20, uh, 2015. Um, Parliament responded by creating a new regime where we allow for assisted suicide but then it was limited only to those who are at end of life you yeah. know so, so it was only available to people who were actually dying and then a court challenge went to a, a lower court judge in quebec saying well that's discriminatory why do you only allow people who are dying to have access to it what if i'm suffering but i'm not dying shouldn't i get a right to it and one lower court judge one judge struck down that prohibition said nope we're going to open it up to any adult who is suffering whether they're dying or not yeah what was parliament's reaction they said okay well that's what we'll do and they they just rewrote the law again instead of saying what what does one judge know uh, right. parliament wrestled with that question for 16 months it went through two houses of parliament the house of commons and the senate they brought in experts from all over the country religious ethical legal medical experts to hear from them and their testimony um Canada engaged in a debate over that issue for 16 months and one judge, one judge strikes it down. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what Parliament should have done is said, no way, we're going to appeal that. Um, and, and we'll hear from the Supreme Court on this again. Who knows what would have happened there? But I, I suspect the Supreme Court of Canada would have upheld uh, the old legislation that limited it to just end of life. Well, the inconsistency seems uh, well interesting to say the least. Hey, so, oh, you know, we mentioned earlier we got to do like a three-hour chat because we can talk law and constitution and and Canadians' role and citizens' role in, in our country for hours. Uh, I love the topic, and I think we all can learn more. But hey, j just as we got to wrap up because we're running short on time, I want another shout out for your book, the second edition, the second volume of of a Christian's Guide to Citizenship. Quick question for you: Is what's the best way for Christians or Canadians to get involved in our political system? Oh, that's a oh man. It, it, there's a lot of different a lot of different ways, and yeah. and really, it, it probably the answer would depend on what kind of a person are you. And and the last chapter, chapter seven, invites different Canadians who have different skills, different ta talents to be involved in different ways. Um, but I'd say like getting involved um, beyond just voting on election day is really important. Um, education is is key so stay informed yep. you know you don't have to read the news every minute of every day but but at the very least you know get a saturday newspaper if you don't have one already and and read up on politics see what's going on um get to know your local representative you know you're you have an mp a member of parliament who represents you in ottawa um try to get to know them uh that doesn't mean you have to to visit them every week but if you, you know they do summer barbecues they do christmas um circuits and so on you can visit them once or twice in a, in a year that would be good um and then uh i would say get involved in uh in a campaign um or a political party whatever political party aligns with where you're at um you know check them out check out their platform see what they advocate for see if that aligns with where you're at as a canadian uh, see if they align with your values mostly align you know you'll never find a perfect fit yeah. Um, and then and then get involved. It doesn't mean you have to run for politics, but maybe you can support those who do put their name forward. And uh, that might be a really good way to be involved as well. Awesome. Well, Andre, thank you so much. Andre Schutten, everyone. You can find him at ARPA and, and what they're all doing. Keep track with everything that they're doing for our country and for political action and, and all, the, uh, all the things that you guys are being involved. I appreciate your time, man. It's been really good to chat with you. We'll have to do it again soon. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on the show. You are an essential part of this series. Support truth, knowledge, and wisdom by sharing this show with a friend. Visit returntoreason.tv. There, you can subscribe to our newsletter by clicking Become an Insider. Get the latest articles, episodes, and exclusive content. It's Return to Reason.